welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Geekify Inc., now, now coming to us with the Neopets TTRPG. Who thought, who thought that was going to be on their bingo card a year ago? The one, the one and only John Taylor. No, no Thomas jokes. We've heard them all, and no Tim Taylor jokes. We've heard them all too. <laughs> How you doing today, man? Uh -huh. Hello, <laughs> John here. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you for coming on and braving the hell of scheduling and time zones. Oh, of course. Happy to do it. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ooh, uh, first games that we probably played were, uh, I would say... Super Nintendo Earthbound. So uh, that was a, a classic 16-bit that just kind of, sort of opened me up to role-playing games in general. Kind of set the stage for what would become a love of games like Final Fantasy, of uh, the Warcraft series, of just anything that kind of made for good character and story-driven games. Uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, I played my first D&D game after uh, having friends that had played it peripherally and nearby me for uh, decades before that. And I finally asked to sit in on a campaign and join in one. So we were running um, Tomb of Annihilation as our first go around. So that was a eye-opening and cool to see how veteran players and noobs were playing together and sort of taking the rules, bending the rules, misunderstanding the rules, and turning it into a overall fun experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well... The rules are just are just suggestions. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of rule zero. What's rule zero? There's just a guidelines? lot of variations of, of it, but it basically it basically is saying these rules are meant for entertainment. If a certain rule in the in the book is getting in the way of that entertainment, throw it out. Oh, absolutely. We ended up using a lot of that. That spirit is very true to. Uh, everything that we do in our gaming site and system. So, um, yeah, we fully embody that and embrace that. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you went, went into that the way you did because I was, because, um, it's reinforcing something that I've, I've said in the, I've said in the past that you're, that a lot more people are going to be getting into TTRPGs via video games than, what war get then through wargaming, which is how it was in the early days of the hobby. Um, but that's a but that's a whole other kettle of fish. So I suppose I suppose the next the next phase of the origin story would be the introduction to Neopets and how we got into how we got to this point where a Neopets TTRPG is something that it is something that is being developed. So, pretty much everyone had a Neopet or knew someone who had a Neopet. I think there was 50 to 100 million active users, like, way back in its heyday in the, the mid-aughts of 2000. Uh, so it was definitely a, a interesting way to spend your time online. I personally would get up at 2 or 3 in the morning because uh, on my dial-up modem, so I could actually go and purchase things in the store because no one else was up at that hour, presumably. So uh, it was a, a wonderful online community. It was a wonderful online game system. And th it's been around for 25 years, and it's still going to this day. They just got uh, new management and new owners last year, and they've been working really hard to revitalize the site. They've got their first plot line, new plot line, uh, going for the first time in years. And uh, that's running right now. It just started a couple months ago, and it's going to be running for the next six months or so. It's the void within. Mm -hmm. But probably about four or five years ago, we hired a new artist whose name was Amy, and her portfolio had a lot of Neopet stuff in it. 
and we'd hired her for other projects, other art stuff that we were working on. And uh, as part of the interview process, Amy and I kind of bonded over the Neopets stuff. And at one point, a couple months after her hire, she sort of wheedled me in chats like, hey, what would it take to get a license to work with Neopets? It's been kind of my dream to work with them forever. So like, I don't know, a phone call and, you know, a couple grand to get the license, I guess. So she's like, well, can we make that happen? So we reached out to Neopets, we found the licensing agent and uh, worked to get a licensing agreement in place, which was pretty broad and open-ended. So we made a, a pile of merch for the Neopets community, which is still around and going strong. Um, but one of the, we've always looked at sort of the, the lower lying fruit of what's just simple to make, and then more, the more advanced and convoluted projects. We did a tarot deck for them a couple years ago, and then uh, sort of on the back burner has always been this idea of doing a Neopets TTRPG, because the world lends itself so well to it. It's got 25 years of lore, of characters, of plot, of story development, of weapons, of battle systems, items, uh, and, and warring factions. So it's got all the main elements necessary. And what we set out to do was to create a core rule system so anyone can kind of homebrew their own story. But we've also got some of the more official storylines being developed into campaign modules so you can actually play through this particular story arc from 2010, 2012, whenever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because of how long Neopets has been a thing, you've got people who, who, may, have dipped, who may have dipped into the, to the thing back in the aughts and then, and then um, didn't come back. You've got some people who may be diehards who are still dipping into it uh, to this day and everything in between so when designing a when designing a game that's made to be a through line with all of that have you des have you designed it so that even somebody coming in for their fir for their first time or with minimal experience can still get into the TTRPG absolutely and that's been sort of a, a core approach to developing the system was how do we make it accessible for people who have never touched another TTRPG in their lives and how do you hook the attention of people who are veteran players who are looking for a new game system to play through uh, game world to play through and it's been interesting kind of striking the balance there so we have a bunch of hybridized rules along the way and sort of some guidelines for if you want to play in a more advanced style here are some things otherwise here are some ways to simplify and trim down some of the the checks and the mechanics side of things in favor of going a, a more story driven approach mm -hmm. yeah especially at the very least since you've got 25 years of material to work with you're not going to be hurting for <laughs> oh, oh, different forms of content oh now wow Oh, I, I hear a bit of an echo. No, I was just pushing the button. I'm on push to talk. Ah, Keep that, going. Would, that would explain it. So, this is where we get this is where we get into the nitty gritty of things. This is where we start to roll up our sleeves and put the, and um, to ref, to make a hockey reference, drop the gloves. <laughs> because one of the big thing one of the big things that got my attention that i wanted to examine is how this is going to work and up until this point the main thing that i knew is that you guys were using the d20s as your core as your core resolution die and that you were going for a skill based classless affair now based on what based on what i'm seeing is is this a case where the system that you're using is, even though it's using a D20, it is standalone. So, is that would that be accurate? And if so, what is the core resolution mechanic going to be looking like? So, you do have it right. So, it's a D20-based system and dice-driven across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so, initially, this was looking to be... We started out by saying, okay, let's, let's see what happens if we do with this as a 5e adaptation. Uh, after the kerfuffle last year with the open gaming license <laughs> and uh, the, the wizard situation, mm -hmm. we ended up just wanting to avoid that altogether and striking out to make it a more versatile system. Because Neopets is many things to many people. Some people like the more whimsical, lighthearted nature of it. And some people are going to be playing this as though it were D&D. &D. So it's something in between. So we started out with sort of a base of 5e and... Uh, 
kind of started hacking away parts of the system from there and modifying and bolting on other things. So it will look very familiar to players of Pathfinder and 5e, but it's also going to have a lot of other things that have been declunkified to some extent and then made a little more broad and more versatile along the way. So the mechanics will still feel very familiar, but a lot of it's also going to have some other ways of resolving things too. Mm -hmm. uh, and since you're, since we're, you're using D20 as a skeleton of sorts, um, are you going aim high or aim low? Uh, aim high. Okay. So one of the things that we want to explore is it is a the neopets world is stat driven largely you've got your hunger you've got your strength you've got your intellect you have an inherent battle dome in the system but there's also a lot of morphability happening within the world of neopets so you gain and lose levels at the drop of a hat your stats go up and down considerably and in making a featless and classless system, we were looking at ways to make your skills and your stat base scale without making it super math heavy, but also making it an easy way to kind of track what's going on to your character, because uh, you get buffs and debuffs throughout the course of the game. Um, one of the, the neat things of approaching it as a classless system is that there's a lot more versatility in how you play. So you're not pigeonholed into being just a rogue, just a warrior. You have the ability to do allocations towards various skill trees while also kind of maintaining professions of specific interest. Because in Neopets, you could be anything from a stockbroker to a professional you know, race car driver to someone who is a you know a tax accountant on the side or a farmer like it's very very weird and whimsical what you could be but that doesn't necessarily mean that's all that you are in the system either yeah and give and given that you'd either have the option you'd either have to make a bunch of classes to account to account for that or go classless <laughs> and give now given the fact that you are leaning heavily on skit on skills well, while at the same time trying to be as be relatively math light, the next thing I'd want the next thing I'd want to ask is how is how you deal with the potential of analysis paralysis. Just putting too many points into your min max situations and kind analysis of, paralysis analysis. is um, if you're if you're not familiar, it is it is where. Um, where somebody where somebody is hesitant about how they're going to create or advance their character because they don't know if a pick that they make now is going to bite them on the ass two or three sessions down the road. Ah, I am glad that you asked that. One of the things that we actually built right into the system was the ability to respec at any time. So speaking to what's happening in the world of Neopets, you can morph your character's physical form, their shape, their color, like you can change them physically and no one in Neopia seems to bat an eye at the fact that suddenly you're one species one day and a completely different species the next just by taking a potion or stepping in front of a lab ray or you know, taking a dip in a particular fountain. So your physical form can and does change either on a whim, like you would change your hair or story driven if you need to blend in or achieve certain things in certain regions too. So the versatility of that also gives us a lot to play with um, in terms of uh, respecting your abilities too. You can go and rebrand and reallocate your skills however you want. You might be a stockbroker with telekinesis one day, but then you might be a, a dung mancer with a particular proficiency for bows the next. Mm -hmm. So you kind of whatever it is that you want to do, and it's not done willy-nilly it's sort of done in a, a story driven and certain points of the plot that you can do it but it gives you the the freedom and the flexibility to really play multiple different styles if you really want to it's like eh, i'm bored playing this rogue an analog let's go play something else let's go play a diplomat for instance yeah now speaking on that one of the big things that i talk about a lot on my various live streams on this channel is guidance it is important is important for both the not just for the new player experience but even for the returning or advanced player experience to get to give guidance when you have brought when you have broader concepts or you have 
a lot of moving parts. And then, with that in mind, within the core book, do you plan on putting in some sample builds if somebody wanted to lean towards this or that type of archetype? Oh, absolutely. Because you can also have choice paralysis there too. It's like, what do I even want to be? So it's like, we'll we'll definitely have a couple templates and archetypes. It's like, okay, if you were familiar with rogues, here's kind of what you would want to aim for. Uh, here's what you would basically want to construct yourself to look like with these kinds of stats. But feel free to play around with the tech tree. And if you just want to sort of be a jack of all trades and put a lot of points across a bunch of different you know baskets, you end up with a much broader set of skills and a lot more tools in the tool chest, but you're not particularly more one of anything that way. Mm -hmm. Now, since you brought up a tech tree, let's get into that. So, is this is the tech tree going to be something that is um, that it that works alongside development and skills, or is it something that's separate? That is sort of where you are getting your abilities from. So, you unlock various abilities and various. Uh, tasks and or, I'm sorry, feats that you can use by pl by allocating your points into it. Um, as you get deeper into a particular tech tree, you get more adva advantages and uh, synergies with it. Um, because you can respec as well, there are also training schools, so you can sort of lock in certain abilities that if you're willing to put in the time and effort, even if you reroll your character, you can still hang on to certain abilities without necessarily having that allocation because you've permanently ingrained it and attached it to yourself so that you can carry it with you. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a lot more ability to sort of turbocharge your character over a really long campaign, for instance, and that way you also see more and more progressions like, okay, I really want to keep that levitation ability, but I want to go back to being a stockbroker or explore something else, you know? I yeah. keep using stockbroker because yeah. uh, uh, Nigel the, uh, the uh, Chia is um, one of the more iconic, weird classes that we keep fixating on. It's like, why does Neopets have a stock market in the first place and only one person has a car? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, a class that comes to mind, but... Well, I th I'd say it's a good class to utilize in this kind of thing because ever anybody could anybody can come up with a warrior or a rogue or a ranger or, or whatnot in these kind of things. But coming up with something a little more out there as far as classes is a good demonstration of how far you can stretch it. Now, I'd like to I'd like to put that to the test, and I'd like I'd like to I'd like I'd be curious how, if somebody came to your table at when you're running this and they and I'm getting I'm gonna use my gimmick because it's me they say they want to do something akin to a monk uh, the the typical the typical hand-to-hand -hand combat hand-to-hand -hand combatant no armor dodging a lot all, all of that good stuff how would that be accomplished within this system uh, quite easily. So there's a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand, close combat sort of skills. So a lot of the tech tree has a, a lot of the skill trees are elementally aligned because those are lore significant in Neopets mm -hmm. uh, of having the various fairies, the various um, representations of elements and colors. Uh, but if someone says, I want to build a monk, there are a lot of approaches to that. And one thing I do want to touch on here we one we're particularly proud of the pacifism system that we've developed for this game as well of ways of dealing with things non-violently so it's good that you bring up the monk because you could either have a beat the crap out of them style of monk with all your hand to hand or you could be more of the zen buddhist chant them to sleep kind of a approach to things um and so there's just different ways of playing within this system and uh, with the pacifism system it gives you a lot of versatility to approach things in a non-violent way because while there is a lot of combat in neopia not every problem is going to be solved by clobbering someone to death with your with your weapons or hands mm -hmm. uh, remember folks violence is not the answer violence is the question sometimes the sometimes <laughs> uh, but that is that is important. That is important, and I'm, I'm, and to fur to further get on combat for a moment, I'm guessing that this is a game that's going to lean more into theater of the mind than traditional grid combat. Would that be accurate? Mix of both. We will have the tools to enable you to do it, but honestly, things like 
positioning and movement speeds and, and all of that can largely be thrown out the window if you want to play it that way. If you want to be more advanced and more technical with it, something like the Dungeons & Dragons system where you could play it out, it's like, okay, you're here, you're there, you're blocking your doorways and it's like doing a lot more physical side of things versus a, okay, here's a more basic combat resolution of using skills, imagine yourself being there. Uh, it really kind of depends if you're wanting to do the more advanced, complex style of things, or if you want a more simplified version of doing it. We found that a lot of our users actually thought that the combat systems of other games took too long and were rather clunky, and they don't really convey a whole lot beyond technical, you know, a, a little drudgery. Mm -hmm. I can I can see I can see that and truth be truth be told, I wouldn't well you could well you, I've always been at the approach of, um, when in Rome you do as the Romans do. I'm not I wouldn't be in favor of trying to of trying to force Neopets into doing a dungeon crawl just because that's what a given setup is built around, or just be or in some cases just because it's fantasy. Um, and. Speaking of, speaking of that, I'm get, would it be fair of me to guess that the magic system is going to be more on a points based affair rather than char rather than um, a set number of charges, a la the Vancian model? There's going to be a mix of both, and the reason why is because you can choose to use magical abilities and weapons that are. That what if you are not inherently magical too? Uh, Neopets is just lousy with all sorts of staves and scrolls and magical items that you use in the battle dome, even if you don't necessarily have that particular skill or ability. So you can use it as an artifact or as a, a consumable rather than putting in the time to be a wizard. You can be the uh, you know, flash in a pan version in a pinch, got the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. with the right scroll or the right staff. That actually ties into something else that we've been exploring is there are bajillions of items in Neopets. And so we've been sort of overhauling the crafting system because I want to say at last count there were 50 to 100,000 items in the Neopets database and they add more constantly. And there are people who do galleries to them and people who collect them. There are a lot of different currencies and so there are a lot of different reasons to want to incorporate and add them into the world and the crafting system has actually been a really good way to treat those as consumables because then you have things that have charges inherently as well yeah i can i can certainly see that and speak speaking of do you plan on putting in guidance for for how for how someone might convert uh, some of the many many items you mentioned from the get from from Neopets itself, whether it be through the game or up or otherwise, into this TTRPG, not a hard set of rules, but a set of suggestions. Absolutely. So there are a lot of things to kind of empower the DM and sort of uh, fuel their imagination too. It's like here's a list of a, a bajillion items. You can implement them in any way you see fit. You can mention them, you can not mention them. Every region has its own localized version of, let's say, uh, you know, a, a omelet, for instance. There's a, a omelet that you can go to and get free omelet pieces from, but there's also spooky omelets, and there's also uh, underwater omelets, and there's you know, variants of the various regions of Neopia that don't really need to be covered in the guidebook except to say, hey, Neopets does have all of these millions and millions of items. You can do something weird and wacky with that. Here are some hooks to do and to attach to these various kinds of flavorings of items. Uh, use your imagination. Here's some of our suggestions, but you're really free to come up with what you want from this extremely broad database. Mm -hmm. I, c I can certainly get that. And I mainly say that because while I'm sure you're going to be bringing in a lot of st a lot of stuff from the source material, there's only so much you can do unless you want to have a book a book that's the si that's as thick as my head. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, it's, the core rules is already going to be a doozy. We're, we're having to figure out what needs to make the final cut and what can be sort of auxiliary materials as well. Mm -hmm. And doing things like the items, it's pointless to list every different kind of variant of item, but it's enough to say they exist and that here are some suggestions. Oh, yeah. Now, shifting, fr shifting from the core book... One of the uh, one of the other materials that's in the Kickstarter package is, I, I believe you're planning on, the, on this being a ca a uh, campaign art with the fall of Fairyland. Correct. So that's going to be a decently long campaign module for, if you don't want to come up with your own storyline. Here is a very very major storyline like integral to Neopets history that you can play through. Um, so you've got your, your big bad who's sort of pulling the strings behind the scene. You've got all of the people behind, like, trying to rally to solve the problem of the fairies are starting to turn to stone. And ultimately with the, the collapse and fall of Fairyland from the sky. Mm -hmm. So it is a huge thing that kind of touches and impacts a lot of the world of Neopia. And it gives you a lot of places to explore, reasons to go there, and then a coherent plot to follow. Uh, again, some of those players have never touched a TTRPG in their lives, and so they might not have the patience to create their own story or just be sort of unsure how to proceed. So having a fully formed campaign module as well gives them a way to play through their familiar world. Yeah, and that that is an important distinction to make. Um, that you've got you got some people who are going to be coming into this who are either veterans or or semi veterans of TTRPGs. Some who are on the opposite end end of the spectrum. The the more the more online stuff is where their forte lies, and some are going to be right in the middle, and even more are going to be playing catch up with this. Uh, there's also the possibility that somebody might be coming in who only has tangential knowledge of Neopets and has to has to have the gaps filled in. Um, and given the given the given the um, vast amount of regions, I am curious if down the road you plan on re releasing something of a gazetteer, you know, something that's a um, a way to quickly a way to quickly establish parts of the world. Uh, yeah, we've got sort of a, a little regional overview of what's where, and then a more broad, in-depth, here's what this region's known for. Here are the, the relevant people, the NPCs, the stores. Um, so it can kind of, you've got your little synopsis of here's why it's relevant to the world of Neopia. Read more for more details. So yeah, we will have a simple overview and a much deeper dive into the lands. Now... In a lot of online games, a lot, whether it be MMO or or the or the like, item crafting is a big deal, and this is something that a lot of TTRPGs, in one form or another, even the ones I enjoy, have struggled with in some form or another. Uh, a lot of times, it ends up being either way too complicated or, in some cases, way too busted. There, but it. Regardless of regardless of the issue, there's some kind of catch with how item crafting ends up working. So with this, how do you plan on having item crafting? Because again, it is a big deal. While also keeping to that accessibility you're trying to go for. So in Neopets, you have a lot of moats and you have novas and supernovas kind of floating around. Um, Taking a side tangent here, one of the fun things about this project has been sort of taking why things are the way they are in Neopets and giving a canonical explanation for them and a physics of world building for it. So how does a thing come to be? Why is this thing so important? What is it doing in there? Uh, w for what could have been just a very whimsical developer choice of like, I don't know, it sounded cool, coming up with the underlying platform for why this thing works mechanically in the world and we see it the way that, it, present the way that it does, uh, has been really cool because we get to write lore behind the world building too, to kind of augment and bridge the gap to a random 
decision made 25 years ago on the, the website to a D&D style game nowadays. Um, so for the crafting system, the moats and the novas are things that are ingredients that you get as loot drops that you can use to build bigger and better items. So some things you just sort of magic cauldron, almost like a Haradric cube in Diablo, throw things together with other magical items and some crafty stuff and you get, you know, new enhanced magic item. Um, some of it's more advanced, requiring more blueprints or, or you know, crafting design kind of things. Um, time is one of the things that we are still working to get a really good handle on because we were discussing how uh, legendary items in D&D take 50 years to craft. It's like, ain't nobody got time for that. So um, that's still something that we're really hammering in is how we want to do that. But we've got a couple really good candidates of directions we want to go now that we've figured out sort of the ingredient style and how you do the mixing of things, just how you do your, your time slotting for that to make it make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, uh, when it comes to puzzles, this is another thing that a lot of TTRPGs have um, struggled with. How do you, how do you handle puzzles in a way that the that um they don't become too obtuse for people who aren't as strong in in the veil of madness that is puzzles in um, point and click games, <laughs> as it were. Um. We've got, you know, 50 years of, of tabletop RPGs to sort of draw upon. Um, one of the things with puzzles is that you can make them very complex. You can make them very simple, but ultimately they're catered to your specific audience. So having a wide range of puzzles of sort of a, okay, here's your more novice level, here's your more advanced, and here are the ones that require a lot more, uh, let's say, research or uh, attention to detail to really get or to solve. So having a wide variety that the DM can sort of draw on is has been something we've been focusing on to make sure that you don't get stuck, but you also don't make it too easy for anyone in your party either. Mm-hmm. That can that might be like that can, that can make that can make sense. Oh. Then it because even even people even when people are more adept with puzzles, there are still some types of puzzles that will give them more trouble than other. Looking at you, slide puzzles. <laughs> uh, I don't like slide puzzles. They work counter to my brain. It's like having a crochet with boxing gloves on. <laughs> um, in tandem with puzzles, we've also been working on mini games too to add into the system because not everything necessarily has to be a dice roll, for instance. But uh, we've been playing with like a using like a paper fortune teller to determine certain things happening. Uh, we've got a large amount of random events because those are really important in the site. Some good, some bad, and some very neutral, uh, but they're happening kind of on a constant basis of just impacting your world on a continuous, in a continuous way. Um, but solving the puzzles has just been a interesting thing of, okay, what worked, what didn't? And part of the community feedback phase that we're in right now with the Kickstarter is we're, we're opening a lot of things up to public eye and public scrutiny over the next month or two and requesting requests for what is it that you've seen work in other games? What is it that you found super clunky? And what are things that you really, really want to see integrated? Because in Neopets, there are tons and tons of Flash games that you could play to earn Neo points. Some of them were themselves puzzles, and they actually give really, really handy starting points to adapt into a familiar in-game puzzle for the TTRPG. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to talk a bit about factions, since that's something that I honestly think is underrated when it comes to TTRPGs. And... Within that, is it possible for someone to use the reputation that someone's developed within a faction to essentially use it as social currency? You know, for calling your Absolutely. favors, getting special equipment, that kind of thing. Yep. And that actually ties really heavily into the pacifism system because reputation and social influence can be a very key component of it. You might be a very skilled diplomat able to talk your way out of anything like you can charm anyone but ultimately like how do you persuade your big bad to not be so evil anymore and not pull the death ray trigger and ultimately there there are things that you can do that aren't 
one-on-one -on -one interactions. They are side quest related things where you can undermine their ability as a faction. So as evil boss, you know, they're, they're getting ready to destroy the world, but they've got a support group of a ton of henchmen. If you can convince the, or persuade the henchmen to come over to your side, or that what's going on is really not the best course of action for anyone, you can effectively undermine the authority of said big bad, and by doing so, achieve your goal in that nonviolent manner. But there's also more, I'd say, daily usage of the, the reputation system and the, the factions where you go on quest, you curry favor with a particular faction, you become well known in whatever chapter, in whatever local area you're at. But there's also the rival faction situation where if you score credit with one, you lose it with the other. Um, in Neopets, one of the big things that was a uh, annual event is the Battle for the Obelisk, where you have several, I think about seven different factions, all vying for control of this mythical obelisk out in the desert. And you are doing your best to undermine the other factions while building up your own so that you can get that control. So we've been able to take that and sort of modify and apply it directly to a more daily interaction within the world of Neopets to achieve other goals, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, now with the with that in with that in mind, do you plan on putting like a, a like a diagram or some sort of quick re some sort of quick reference to show what factions have beef with each other at some on some level? Absolutely, uh, and that's the diagrams and charts. I really think are going to be the name of the game in this book, just because it's easy to visualize something that might take a paragraph or two, and you know you sort of get lost in the text. Well, here's a clean, easy diagram to look at and say, oh, okay, <laughs> working with these guys means I'm enemies with these. Mm -hmm. It's essentially essentially the faction equivalent of a relationship chart. Now, yeah, I know that I know that there's some some other stretch goals, uh -uh. and uh, and uh, obvi obviously obviously that's go that's going to make things. Oh, interesting in some in some form or another, but with the when it comes to the when it comes to the amount of skills, is it a case where it's one of those where it's a lengthy amount of skills, a la um, shadow shadow run, or is it going to be a de a decent size but not as but not exhaustive? That's really been sort of the the trick of doing this. It's going to have a broad library of skills, and there's going to be a significant depth to each of those skills trees as well. But there's only so much you can truly pack into the game, and so there will be additional things, and uh, especially if we do a digital version, easier to kind of keep track of what the uh, extra addendums are or the expansions for the game uh, for covering more abilities, more skills, more classes, more flavor to the world and more skill sets for approaching the world mm -hmm. now long-term question since this is so this is something that it that um is gonna is again is gonna be an elephant in the room even more so in the in the last four years po post lockdowns and all that and that is the vtt question the virtual tabletop question now i'm not expecting an answer for this for this immediately but as a down the road thing is support for vtt's like roll 20 foundry alchemy and the, and the like something that has been under consideration absolutely we've actually been talking directly with roll 20 about doing some things uh for digitization of the existing setup uh and then a couple other companies about doing like a, a tabletop simulator kind of thing and the reason being is the the neopets community is all over the world and our team writing is in across 14 different time zones, I think. Mm. We've got people as far away as the Philippines and Europe working on this project. So understanding time zones and like collaboration of things remotely is huge because all of these people made friends in the Neopets community all over the world and at, you know active at different times of the night or day. Being able to make this a game that's accessible to them is great because... Let's face it, a lot of us are introverts that don't necessarily leave home. Being able to play this thing that we all love and is dear to our hearts and has been for 25 years with other people that share that same passion 
is huge for the game. So it's definitely under consideration in the works of the extent to which we will do that. I know it's listed as a stretch goal, but realistically, it is still a priority for us, even without having the Kickstarter funding to do that. It's important to us because it's important to them. Yeah. Now, speaking of, speaking of that, I do want to congratulate you on the fact that at the time we're recording this, you're just over 125000 You're asking for 40000 with um, 14 days to go. But what would you be shooting for as far as a page count? The core rule book will probably be somewhere in the ballpark of about 800 to 900 pages. We're still undecided if we want to make it multiple volumes or not. Um, there's logistics that go in either direction, and we've built it so it can be one volume, or we can, in the editing process, just turn it into several if it's just going to be too much of a pain in the butt to do it as one big mammoth tome that you know falls apart under its own weight. Um, the Fall of Fairyland will probably be somewhere in the vicinity of about 200 pages or so. Uh, covering the plot and all the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I could I could easily see it. I could easily see the core book getting split, especially since I've seen some companies do a player's guide variant of their core books, where it's just the player facing material within it. Um, as a bit of a side thing, um, the cipher system does that has done that a fair bit with both Numenera and the Strange, just as one example, but. As far as a release window, not a date per se, but a ballpark, what would you be shooting for? We are looking at wrapping up development of the game within about the next six months or so. So part of that, we're, we're giving ourselves significant time to take what we've spent the last two and a half years developing and then incorporating community feedback and then doing a lot of play testing alongside that with the community. So having public eye on it is great because we get to find the, the flaws and the difficult points for new and old players. It also gives them a hand to in contributing certain things to the game too. So we have some people who are like, you know, I've always wanted to see this one thing in Neopets. It's my favorite thing. No one's ever done anything with it. So being able to include a bunch of Easter eggs that are personalized to fan requests is, you know, it makes us happy, makes them happy. Um, that six-month development cycle is sort of locking everything in, undergoing a very judicious review and editing process with uh, internally and then with the Neopets team, and then another round of edits and revisions from that point. So we're setting our, our goal as about a year out with six months for the editing, a couple months for revisions, and then production of about three months beyond that. Mm -hmm. So July of next year, we're hoping to have our finished copies in hand. All right. I can, I can certainly get behind that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for more of this or any other project you guys have cooking down the road, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere just thanks. Reminder, to just a reminder to all your all the fans out there: go feed your Neopet. <laughs> go feed your Neopet, or I'm, or I might have to put you through stretching practice. Uh, but and, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the quest, and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came out came from here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!